Hello again, uh, everyone. Welcome to ZBrush Live. I'm Tony Leonard sitting in on this Saturday. Uh, I'm going to start up here in just a second. I had to work out a few things uh, with my stream. So stand by and I will get started in just a moment. Let me just make sure everyone... Alright, uh, if, if you're watching, let me know if you can hear me and you can see me on screen. I'm going to actually flip over to my ZBrush work environment here shortly. And uh, if you can let me know if you can see, see everything okay. I had a few run-ins, I think, before where uh, I had a little bit of a problem with uh, flipping some of the screens in between what you should see on screen and what I had going. So if there's any problem, let me do, know in the chat, and uh, let's get underway. All right. Wanted to dig something up for you guys to show you um, from start. So just give me one sec. Uh, there we go. Alright, so today I wanted to go over some things with you guys. Here, I'm going to flip over to my screen now. I think it should be alright to go. Screen capture. There we go. Video webcam. There I am. Hi, guys. Welcome. And uh, I, you know, last time around when I streamed, um, I showed you guys kind of some of my workflows doing some things uh, texturing um, using ZBrush as the source modeler um, basically ZBrush to Blender and then on from there and how I might uh, derive UVs and then I did a little bit of texturing I believe in Quixel Suite too which um, actually is a product that's kind of on its way out and um, the good news in that is that uh, Mixer will soon take its place uh, in the texturing game and you'll be able to add a lot of um, you know varieties of um, texture mixes and procedural textures uh, that you can make out of uh, Mixer, uh, which will, I guess, apparently be Mixer 2020, uh, as a, and which I guess is forthcoming because they just joined forces with Epic, which congratulations to the Quixel guys on that. And uh, so, you know, I wanted to show you guys kind of my workflow for texturing uh, models that come out of ZBrush. You know, like thinking forward, you know, when you work in ZBrush and then maybe a little bit more beyond, like say if you wanted to render something. And so today I kind of had some assets set, you know, to show you guys. So I'm going to full screen this because uh, working with my VFX partner uh, and friend, uh, Chosen, um, of uh, Chosen One Media, he and I have joined forces and have been making some movie clips, like little small, uh, you know, sort of like demo clips where we were building a narrative up and I wanted to show you guys some of the results of some of that because some of those models sometimes uh, you catch here in stream and so you know just to kind of let you know where a lot of your models can go if you put a lot of work into some of them this is something that he and I have been putting together and we're testing rendering out um, a lot of this uh, workflow in Unreal uh, moving and using Unreal as sort of like a cinematography tool so I'm going to be doing a lot of sculpting here uh, pretty soon, uh, creating characters for this uh, and using some, you know, sort of uh, steps that I've been talking about for months with uh, all of you who watch, uh, continuously watch on uh, uh, ZBrush Live and, and for that, your patronage, I appreciate. Uh, but without much ado, I'm just going to try to roll this and kind of show you guys what's up and what I've been working on. So this is a, a character that I think um, I had leftovers of some parts like the major suit, the red part of the suit from uh, a Marvelous sculpt. Um, 
but actually I had a friend, Voodoo Warrior Sculpt, and uh, Voodoo Warrior put his uh, his uh, bling on something that I was totally different than this, right? And I took the suit and I modified it and added uh, not only just like a few small little kitbash elements, but sculpted up the helmet in ZBrush, uh, did a little retopology to do some surfacing and shaping, uh, so it was plated out, and then I did it in over, you know, arcing uh, topology of everything, and threw it into Mixer later. Uh, and then all of the textures were done in Quixel Suite, uh, as well for the, co the corridor piece, which um, actually we've tweaked this corridor piece a little bit, added a few more lights, uh, turned the emissives a different color, but originally the flooring was all red. Um, and one, it's actually kind of uh, an advantage point because um, you can kind of color compose elements sometimes when you bring them, or uh, by the time you bring them into Unreal, uh, by just using some color ramp nodes on the textures themselves and changing the environment entirely, right? Like, like let's say if he's the focal and he's red, uh, you know, he has emissives which draw sort of like a strong focal point, uh, and then there's cooler colors that are still kind of along the warm scale, um, but yet cooler enough to cause some contrast for the focal point of our POV or point of view, right? So stuff like this, and um, actually, you know what? I'll play this one as well. There's a large ship uh, that I designed and modeled in not only box cutter but uh, for Blender, but also I did a lot of work in ZBrush, and I'm going to probably open that project up and show you a bit because it's pretty large. Um, in fact, before I roll this clip, I should probably just show you a few things. Uh, that I did here. I'm going to actually open up Marmoset because I've already modeled it and have a low. Um, let's see here. I want to show you this because I've put all of the parts together um, for it. Here we go. It's kind of a big project, so let me take a second. But this was kind of an amazing build. Uh, just as an experiment, um, I have been working a lot of the assets that I work in ZBrush and take them and run um, an application that I learned about actually through um, uh, Mike Pavlovich, who turned me on to Instalog, um, which is basically a, a, an Instalog, or it's basically an LOD uh, plugin and, and also a standalone um, application. And it, it will take very high polys and crunch them down uh, to tries. Uh, so for hard surface, it, it works for you know really good, uh, you know surfacing and that sort of thing um, and optimizing of the mesh. And then it bakes and UVs it and it does automatic UVs. Uh, and if I have um, color IDs actually in the color space or the vertex color space, so I think a la last time around I, I took you guys through ZBrush just really quick with a model that I had and it had multiple parts and or poly groups and I just uh, applied um, poly paint to them uh, sort of in a random fashion using the uh, poly paint or you know I think it's paint by poly group uh, feature inside uh, the tool menu uh, and then basically with poly groups I used it to do all of the texturing so like if I save an FBX or something but for this entire ship um, I pretty much used box cutter and ZBrush, and it's very detailed. And I kind of wanted to over stamp it to sort of achieve sort of like a, a retro '80s kind of sci-fi, you know, very kind of almost analog uh, model ship kind of uh, feel uh, with lots of details, you know, so that then I could break it up into you know sort of high contrast pieces, and you know just work with something really fun. But in the same way. I uh, used uh, box cutter, you know, blender, same workflow again, and created the inside uh, of the ship a little bit. So um, a little different to the co to the cockpit part of it that I'm going to show you in just a second. This area is just like a corridor that's been bored out, and then the model pieces have been inserted on on the inside of it, so that we you know sort of get some uh, more detail on the inside of the ship, right? And later I could just you know, rig the door shut and have like a nice little prop or asset prop. But it has uh, different stages. I had to actually part it out um, and create some of these blocks 
uh, separately and, and, and actually bake them separately uh, So because it was so large that I, I couldn't get a really good optimal uh, bake off of just uh, it as an entire, you know, uh, manifold mesh or anything like that. But uh, I'm going to try to pay attention to the chat here and uh, let me know if you're around, if you can hear me. Um, the LOD software that I just talked about was Instalod. Um, it looks a lot like this. I'm going to flip over to Maya really quick, and I have it installed for Maya. But uh, basically, what I can do is I can bring in um, a decimated mesh or um, anything like a, a high poly mesh that, uh, you know, again, I decimate or bring in somehow. You know, like if it, if it can be handled by uh, Maya, you can bring it in and you can run Instalot and basically bake out LODs, you know, in steps. And you can even set up like a LOD profile. And so this has been sort of a, uh, a really good tool to use um, going inside of uh, Unreal, which actually if I can touch upon it today, I wanted to kind of uh, talk about some Unreal um, things that you can kind of bring your ZBrush models um, in and then beyond the texturing, you, if they've already got textures, you can set them up in Unreal on like a snap. So if you've been wondering how you can probably just do sort of like the really quick way to kind of bring assets into an Unreal environment and do some rendering, you know, I, I would love to show you guys some of that. So j today's kind of like just procedural, but then I'm actually going to spend some time in ZBrush. Uh, and I have to kind of apologize uh, up front. Uh, I didn't have time this week to, to get um, upgrade, so I haven't rolled out 2020 ZBrush just yet. Um, you know, on, on my main workstation that I'm, I'm working from here. But um, anyway, let me go back uh, to this model and I'm actually gonna full screen it and hide the controls. And so all of the more like lower details of this ship, uh, just for an example sake, were done um, in ZBrush. And there's a few errors in some of them and I kind of, um, you know, like some of the pieces, some of the textures, turned out just a little bit weird with some of the detail uh, and the way that it baked and a lot of it has to, tends to be with um, sometimes you gotta be careful of you know how the normals or if you have extreme normals that you know might cause uh, baking errors like just ever so slightly it's kind of hard to tell but maybe something like this where there was a triangulated corner and it burned in so maybe you know it might be good you know as a check to kind of check your normal angles when you um, end up in maybe in like another uh, 3D package where you can, you know, maybe change the, like Blender I know has uh, weighted normals and also uh, you could deal with something like, uh, I believe, changing the normal angle inside of Maya, um, which might straighten it out. Or having, you know, when you do a bake, recalculating the normals uh, might be a good idea. But anyway, uh, I usually, I have set this, you know, like file up just to, for sort of like a presentation sake. But I, the, the objective is to get this entire ship into Unreal. Uh, and what I've been working with is taking some pieces of things and then when, by the time that I set them up, um, get them into Marmoset and then using the Unreal Marmoset uh, Scene Importer, I believe it is. It's a plugin that you can get off of Marketplace. Uh, I use that to further take the assets from Marmoset after I've done all of my staging and composing of different models and maybe into a scene uh, and then I shoot them over to Unreal using that right so pretty much you know here is where I do a lot of like you know just proofing you know I can kind of go into here uh, let me straighten out my camera here I can click on a piece of geometry and hit control F and center in on that and if I turn this around I can get a nice little uh, view out the window with the pilot sitting there uh, and these guys are actually I've got the sticky focus in, on here hold on a second there we go so that should be a little bit more focused every time uh, I have sticky focus for depth of field set so every once in a while when I move the camera around it starts to blur but uh, I'm trying to work the interior of this um, you know open space of the model and it's just basically encased with a canopy like a glass piece and then another piece of geometry so that the glass sort of sits right just level with it you know so that there aren't too many gaps um, they might have to move it around just a little bit but 
yeah, that's the idea is just cap it like you would a regular, uh, you know, like plastic model or something like that. Yeah, the Marble Set Scene Importer is really, really, really helpful. Um, so kind of like, this goes besides, um, uh, and I know a lot of folks like to use Keyshot for, for rendering, and it's a great product. Um, and sometimes I think that uh, it's pretty quick just to use Marmoset in a lot of ways, if you're, especially if you're trying to create something like a, a game asset model or just use it for like cinematics, uh, because it's actually quite powerful um, by itself, Marmoset. And so a lot of things that I take from ZBrush and Maya, I shoot them over here just to compose them, look at them, see how light reacts with it. Um, and maybe procedurally I'll put uh, like a roughness map on something with a blank albedo that I used in Mixer and just sort of start to look at what, you know, like material breakdowns of things would look like. Um, so by the time that I get to texturing, you know, I could just unload and have a go with all the different masks, right? So uh, pretty much this one is, is finished product. And if I click on it, you can see the parts that I did. So there's like the engine pods, the flaps, all of these are separate little meshes that I did independently and then paired them up here. That is why if I was to look at some of the material lists, these are all of the textures that have been loaded into this project. So like even there's, I think there's characters turned off on the inside of here, but it'll take a lot of different meshes, you know, um, grouped together and that's, that's kind of cool. So, you know, even when you're proofing coming out of ZBrush, you know, you can, and you, you do a bake or something like that. Um, I don't know how many of you might use, you know, UV Master along with, you know, some of the baking tools um, uh, inside of ZBrush, but you can always take those, throw them into here, and see how they would actually apply themselves to a material uh, and a model. Um, most of this is all done using PBR workflow, so typically, like, say, if I was to double click on a material, uh, I can kind of show here the material itself. And then if you look down, there's displacement, normal, roughness, albedo, and metalness. So basically what these are, the various maps that make up uh, just one of these textures together, you know, with uh, normal maps, displacement, you know, turn probably pretty low, um, depending on the object. Sometimes it doesn't work out so well, but I, I have it and just set, you know, very low. Uh, and ambient occlusion, which is kind of outside of uh, PBR. So a lot of times I know that ambient occlusion gets actually baked into albedo um, whenever you're working. Uh, sorry, I'm just taking a second to read one of the questions. Uh, for scene assembling uh, as big as this, um, I, I'm sorry, Ian e Easy, I, I'm reading your question just now. Um, do you think a package like Maya or Blender is essential for scene assembling? Well, probably if I was to build um, a scene, typically what I do is I work inside of ZBrush for each element, and then I take those elements and I save them out individually, and then I would probably compose them in a render, um, you know, moving things, arranging things, just like a, a director would say, well, let's put a set over there, and I want a wall behind there, and I'd like lamps here. Same thing, uh, I use uh, Marmoset to kind of build up scenes uh, and then compose them. Uh, and the same thing has now started to go for working in Unreal. You know, like I'll go from Marmoset to Unreal and then uh, you know, I'll save the Unreal project and hand it off to my partner and he sets up the render and a lot of the animation. And we go back in between that and maybe like say Blender, you know, to do a lot of the rigging and the animation parts. But yes, having a package like Blender or and or Maya um, helps a lot for some of the extra modeling concerns that you need to work out, um, leading to a bake, uh, fixing meshes, that sort of thing. Because there's you know other sets of like uh, mesh editing tools, I suppose you could say um, that would be best, right? But uh, yeah. Headaches, headaches are aside, but generally, like, uh, try to work out a lot of quick assets inside of like a week or something like that. Um, and, and so, a lot of these that I'm doing um, for for experimental sake, they're 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 brutally 
uh, put together and not always topologically sound, but then I try to work them to get them that way. So always kind of a, a thing to, to have another package, you know, on top of that. But um, I wanted to show you guys this. So since you've seen the ship, I wanted to play this one. There's actually two cuts of this. And so what you're looking at is uh, an 8K, a clip, animation clip that we've put together. Uh, just showing what we could, you know, probably try to put together inside of, uh, um, inside of uh, not only Blender EV, but also renderings inside of Unreal, right? Here's another one. I, I think this one's great. But uh, I animated sort of a, a trench, like docking bay, uh, with some of my ships that I built last time around in VR. And um, those were kind of cool to um, produce. I'm going to go back just one more because my partner chose and posted a really good one uh, that I wanted to show you guys additionally. That looks great. It's like sort of like a flyover with enough detail, right? And we also wanted to see how some of the textures would hold up uh, in lighting. Um, you know, when they get up to like, say, uh, if we output them at like 8K. So a lot of them hold up pretty good. Sometimes there are certain areas where ha light hits it that it looks just a little bit strange, but all, all in all, it, the model worked out pretty good, right? Yeah, it is a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. So, you know, this is kind of the, one of the encouraging things that I encourage to all of you, the viewers, is, you know, um, putting a sort of story to your models um, makes it a lot of fun. Uh, and you can have a, a, a great experience working between ZBrush, whichever other modeling package you, you do, and then to like a sort of final presentation of that is always a, a thrill. So I'm gonna go back and talk about a couple of things. I'm gonna open up one that I was just working on, uh, and actually, strangely, I'm gonna do this um, here in Marmoset and then also in ZBrush. I'm gonna open up both. So, uh, let's see here. Nope. There we go. So I was just toying with some textures for just like a building prop. Um, I think you guys might have seen me really early on when I started doing ZBrush Live and messing with Blender. I did a sort of Blade Runner style uh, pyramid zagat, I guess it's called, um, much like the Tyrell building. And I've, I've been saving it to use as a prop somewhere in a cityscape um, as I've been trying to build like uh, city scenes and that sort of thing, having like a, a library of buildings um, so that I can just kind of compose something that's really nice and, and well lit. So this is just a little short run, and I ran it through Instalod earlier today, and I guess I can show you kind of how I set it up. So, kind of on the way to doing things not only in Marmoset, but also in Unreal. Let me go back also to ZBrush, and I'm going to load the tool of this, uh, or any tool actually. Uh, got to go back, sorry should have preloaded this before I started the stream. Um, here we go. Nope. Maybe I didn't save it, but I did save this one. Here's one that I did just previous to that, and I'm also going to open that one. Um, draw it out. So this is part of um, like a wall that I did. Uh, oops, sorry. Do that. There we go. And it's just a simple little prop um, for sort of like an industrial wall. And I'm going to be using this one as, as well in some scenes, and I'll show you kind of how I set it up. So after modeling in, inside of Blender, you know, doing a, a few different uh, like bevel cuts uh, and setting up the geometry, um, I saved it out. And actually, just let's do a merge on it. So I'm going to do a merge visible UV it'll be a little bit lighter than working with it in parts and I'll just show so this is kind of strange but I think I got like some flipped faces in here so I'm, I'm just gonna probably I don't have to worry about it here 
so just for display purposes I'm going to go down to display properties uh, and hit double so I should be able to see it this is kind of how it came out after I got out of blender right um, probably if I was going to do more inside of ZBrush what I would do is probably take these and part it out or do a split by groups and then I would take each one maybe like the larger parts and I would dynamesh them and or use ZBrusher to probably work out some of the surfacing because if I try to um, probably group this out with polygroups or polygroup by normal because this has so many different bevels from box cutter uh, it kind of renders doing a polygroup by normal impossible right which I could also in turn if it, if it didn't have these smooth bevel bevels I could take it and just polygroup by normal and each flat face set would get its own polygroup which in turn would be its own UV group right so it's kind of it would be kind of hard to unwrap this but I'm not gonna unwrap it here but just letting you know so that if you ever tried it you know um, it, it would be something to know uh, because if you if you actually just turn the modifier off from coming out of uh, blender if you're using that um, or using the tools that I described uh, basically it wouldn't have this as you can see like very complex uh, bevel on the edges right uh, if you keep it clean or just dynamesh it and then Z remesh it it would probably work out pretty great but anyway for these for this purpose what I did was I just took the triangulated mesh as I had it uh, and because it's comprised of different pieces of uh, geo um, it already had some polygroups and or I could just do a polygroup um, uh, you know, auto groups on it, right? So just to show here, shift M. So poly grouping by auto groups would also work for this. So I would click it, and let's let, in this case, let's just say I already did, right? Because poly groups on here work out pretty well. And then, of course, again, as I probably mentioned in another stream, I'm just gonna go down to poly paint which is all under the tool menu, right? Uh, and then I would just colorize, and actually I could take this gradation off and just poly paint from poly groups, right? And when it does that, you notice that the color changed, and then I'll hit Shift F, and we can see that we have our different color IDs already ready to go. So after that, what I'll do is I'll just save, generally from a Z plugin, uh, I'll save an FBX of the mesh, and or sometimes uh, if it's light enough, I think I'll save alternatively uh, a set of OBJs for it, which will kick out the material. Mm -hmm. But FBX uh, in, particularly, uh, in particular is good because um, it will hold all of the vertex color, right? And when I do that, mm -hmm. let's just say, for example, um, I'm going to save this one and export it. Because, uh, probably wouldn't take much to do so. I'll save it and we'll just do um, test wall. And I'll take you through this process. All right. So I'll save the FBX uh, and what I have checked is all that are visible uh, bin and for this um, because the mesh is triangulated, if you were working with a, all quads or something or subdivisional modeling, I would probably suggest this. Um, or even if you had retopologized it, and so you have you know nice you know tight loops and quads, I would turn on uh, S normals, which is basically smooth normals, right? Um, and it will smooth the mesh on its exit when it exports, right? In this case, um, I'm actually just going to use the hard normal, so I'm not going to turn on S normals. I'm just going to go ahead and save it as an FBX as it, it is as it is. There might be a little bit of fascinating in some of the geo because uh, I think I didn't subdivide like the pipes or something like that. Um, but uh, I'm not going to worry about it because actually the camera will probably never get that close uh, enough. I just want some detail from a nice far back shot um, and or just maybe probably shadowed. So I'm just going to save this. Let it save here. File exported. Cool. And I'm going to go over to Maya actually for a minute. And this is where I set up things for InstaLive. So um, I don't know if maybe I have time for this. Actually, I won't probably do a full bake, but I'll show you what they look like and how to set it up. 
um, because this sometimes the some of the times for baking can be kind of unpredictable depending on resolution and how high you do it and I don't want to keep you guys on the edge for like 30 minutes trying to <laughs> bake this up so anyway let me check questions uh, yeah let me know if you guys have any questions or anything I'm happy to answer okay so anyway let's go back over to Maya and we're going to um, just do an import and I'm gonna go find it there it is test wall high and FBX we'll group it uh, preserve references that's probably pretty standard and I'll just import it and it'll read the FBX file and put it in here as a group and probably if it comes in it's gonna probably come in a little bit small sometimes scale between the applications are a little bit funky so I'm just gonna grab and select the group in the outliner in Maya and just hit uh, E or actually R sorry and scale this up All right so when I have a good enough size maybe I might um, bring it above this the grid surface hit W situate it nicely right about there yeah that's fine and let's take a look at this because um actually this probably had like a few different material groups on it it looks like um probably this one's a different material than this but um that probably won't matter very much i'm actually going to turn on shadows ambient occlusion anti-aliasing and look at it ah here was a problem uh, that I remember I had to work out from this model. So when we had that flipped uh, normal problem, uh, let's see, how did I fix this? I actually had to reverse the faces of it. Uh, I'm gonna right click and go to the faces and then I'm probably gonna double click and select all of these shift and double click and then select all of these and it looks like it got that part so even though it's grouped it's only gonna grab you know when I double click it's only gonna grab the faces from the one piece of geo and then I'll just come up here to mesh display and do a reverse on them and that should fix it right as I deselect so faces flipped back the right way and I think this piece here also is a little wonk so we'll double click it and do the same thing, mesh display, reverse. That's the flip them faces. All right, so that should work. That should work just good. So as you can see, it's still holding uh, all of the triangulation. I haven't made any attempt to try to retopo it or anything like that. Um, but for an asset like this, what I did when I uh, baked it out in Instalod is basically select the group uh, and then basically once you have it installed and open, uh, this is the way that I do it for Maya, and I kind of learned some of these things from Mac Mike Pavlovich, so um, for a detailed ex explanation, I would very much uh, refer to him and his coverage of this app because uh, it, it does some really awesome things. So <clears throat> for this, I think I just uh, did 100% triangles. I'm not really looking to reduce it too much. Um, and then I think uh, pretty much a lot of this stuff can stay the same. Uh, feature importance go over to the remesh tab uh, this one is going to be important because mode I'm gonna do something like uh, reconstruct over optimize um, which will totally rebuild um, the faces right uh, and then I would maybe set uh, the face count to high uh, and then the surface construction so when it rebuilds it think of the resolution I've done a couple of different bakes sometimes generally probably normal or high would work um, for a high-res mesh that you bring in this way uh, but to keep some of the details every once in a while you're gonna have to flip it and maybe just uh, wait through a bake uh, going to very high but uh, stand you know standard normal or high um, will kind of reduce some of the bake times of this so I'm just gonna set it to you know high or something like that for example sake uh, and then UV, this is basically pretty important because uh, it's how you're going to plan out your unwrap strategy. So uh, auto and or, um, in this case, I have a lot of hard surfaces. So probably hard surface axial would work pretty good for the gutter size of maybe two to four uh, might be good. 
Automatic occlusion geometry is enabled. I'm going to skip over a little bit to bake. Bake output is what I need to actually um, be on. And this is where we can set our resolution. So I'm going to bake out, like, say, uh, 4096. Uh, and then basically set the sampling. Uh, 4x is fine for this, but you can go as high as 16, which I imagine would be super clean. Uh, so if you want to keep more detail or less along with that high setting that I was mentioning before, um, you can get some, some pretty good sampled maps. And this is also where you set up all of the maps that it's going to output when, when it starts baking. So basically I'm going to uh, set it for tangent space normal, object space normal, uh, ambient occlusion, position, uh, vertex color. Uh, so basically it'll take the vertex color, the, basically the color IDs that we baked before, uh, and it will bake out a, an independent like color map. So that's basically what we're going to be using by the time we get to uh, either substance or quixel to do a lot of the masking and the materials, right? So like every group that was a poly group on this thing, uh, in fact, I think in Maya, I might be able to see it if I hit six on the keyboard. It's probably not. It's probably not going to be visible. I probably after I run in Instalog when I get it out of there, then it tends to be more visible. I don't know why. For some reason, when I hit six on the higher, it just doesn't see it. Anyway, moving on. Uh, I'm going to also set for thickness, displacement, and curvature. Uh, curvature being pretty important because that's what you're going to use for a lot of the edges um, when you start using PBR materials um, like edge wear, metal edge wear, scratches, that sort of thing. Um, and then it'll probably, you know, generate roughness and metallic uh, and use some of the values of your curvature, right? So anyway, going along, uh, I just wanted to hit uh, tangent space and probably want to have this checked um, from default. Uh, binormal per fragment is the setting and then the fun stuff output path where you want to actually kick out the maps so just for this one uh, I had a folder going for it uh, I'm, again I'm not gonna probably trigger it because if I do and let it run for a while um, it, <laughs> it might take you know 10 15 20 minutes for it sometimes uh, for it to go through it depending on the complexity of the model uh, I don't think it would take that long for this, but I'll show you basically what the result would be uh, here in just a second. Um, if I do run it, I could probably take a, a look in advance. So we, let's do that. So I'll just uh, navigate to where I'm going to save it. And I'm going to go into my hard drive here. I'll make a new folder. And I'll say uh, wall insta lod test bake. Right, and I'll just select that one, and so now it knows once it bakes where all of the maps are gonna go. Right, so I think all of the settings are pretty good, and I go over to remesh, and I just go to the bottom and I remesh selected meshes. And so what it's gonna do is read all of the meshes and then automatically do the UVs. Starts optimizing. Maybe, I don't know, maybe this one might be a little quicker, an asset. Generally, it takes about 10 minutes or so, at least, for something like this. So I'm going to flip over for just a second. While that's going inside of Maya, uh, let's... Oop, sorry, I just need a file browser here. And I'm going to go inside an already baked folder for that asset and pull it up for you guys and show you. In fact, uh, let's open up another marmoset and I have this project already laid out. Uh, open recent and sorry, bear with me here for just a second. There we go. All right, so this is the wall, and um, I had this idea of doing a shot of um, the colony of uh, Ganymede, like a, a Ganymede city kind of uh, concept, 
And along its exterior would be like a prop that I would make that would look like a solid wall, uh, kind of inspired by the Blade Runner seawall. Uh, I love that that those shots of that you know very tall wall that you know just blocks off the ocean. But in this case, in this scenario, the wall serves a purpose. It's basically how the place is terraformed, right? And so I would have these you know huge vents or a prop with huge vents, and maybe it would be kicking out oxygen. Uh, in sort of like a dome over the city, right? Uh, so just an idea to kind of play with. And then it has, you know, like service platforms, it looks very industrial, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I have a landscape that I'm going to pair it with. Um, and so probably in Unreal, uh, I'll show you kind of how this one came out. But this is, this is basically how these bakes came out uh, and how they look lit. And in some areas, probably I might bake this again because there's a few, like I said, there's a few um, areas. Well, sometimes when I run Instalod, if I don't, if I'm not careful with the normals, I'll get normal burn in. And so probably I could sort of uh, go into Photoshop and maybe paint some of these hardened, uh, faceted edges that sort of got burned in from using a triangulated geo. Um, it usually doesn't show when the maps are not off, but you can kind of barely see them, and they'll burn into the texture sometimes when you bake. So every once in a while it's good to take something like this and maybe just go along the normal and fix it or paint it out and maybe rebake it. That way it'll be, you know, totally smooth, right? But for now, conceptually, I'm just trying to set up some of the cinematics, the color, the lighting, and look of it, you know, just by using uh, Marmoset, right? So I finished this prop off and then let me show you the maps for this. Uh, I think I got them around. Sorry about that. Had some weird noise. <laughs> YouTube kept playing something. Very strange. Anyway, um, that is still baking and still empty, so I'm not can't open that up. Sorry about that. Just looking for a file that I wanted to open for you guys. Uh, here we go. So basically, this is what the folder looks like. Um, and I've added a couple of different files in this folder. Uh, this was the just a little project folder for that wall piece. And this would be the folder that contains all of the work that I'm, I've done in Quixel. And I'll show you, I'll get to the, how that's organized and what to look for. But basically, these are all of the procedural maps that got baked up out of Instalot, right? Uh, and so I have here basically an occlusion, a color map, a curvature map. In fact, let's just take these all and we'll open them. All right. So I believe this is thickness. And then there's your AO. So it's it did a really complex cut of all of the assets and auto packed them that's basically what you're looking at right and curvature I believe that's the displacement height normal and sometimes I can even you know like if there are big enough planes or depending on how I optimize the mesh a lot of this gets uh, very much cleaner per shape uh, and then basically what I can do is I can sometimes even come in here and do a little bit of normal sculpting uh, either in substance or quixel, um, depending. Like uh, using 3D and normal sculpting with Indu, you can do some uh, extra add add-ins of detail and that sort of thing. Uh, if you have some good planes to work with, right? Uh, so that's basically sort of like how the basic uh, maps end up. And then, say for example, when I come over to uh, let's say uh, substance. Is there a scaling setting? Uh, well, I believe there's a new plugin for scaling uh, with ZBrush. Um, and I believe it's one of the official ones. Um, scale Master, is it? Something like that? Um, working with the scale, generally what I do is, no matter what I'm working on, if I have absolutely the wrong scale, uh, I export it out um, into another package and I set up absolutely what I know to be like a cube 
at like say six feet and then I scale my object appropriately per unit right uh, and that sin tends to <laughs> work out a lot of like scaling issues and then you know naturally in scene I just scale everything to where I think it should be proportionally right and then reset that scale so that it's fixed and that I know it's not gonna mess up but yeah uh, what I'm going to be texturing today, I'm going to show you guys some things with some of the, the wall that I picked up, uh, which baked out of Instalot. In fact, let's see if it's still going, uh, by the way. No. And I'm going to close that. I'm going to keep uh, Substance at the ready. And let's get back over to Maya. Let's see if it's done. Oh, it's almost done. It's at 60%. It's a good thing. See? See how long it takes? And I, I would have kept you guys held on for that, and I don't want to do that. So let's just take a look over here. I'm going to actually hit on Substance New, uh, and then I'll grab the mesh itself. So I'll go to it. Uh, again, I mean City Wall. There we go. Open this up. And there's my OBJ, which um, after this thing ends up... Um, baking out of Instalod in Maya. I mean, I'm going to show you guys how to save it out, but uh, know that basically what I, it kicks out is if you look in your outliner after running the, the Instalod process and you baked all of the map, maps that I set in the same way, what you'll basically end up with is two different groups. One is the original group uh, in the outliner of the model itself that you brought in, and then it it's basically its LOD uh, mesh that it made lower to that right uh, and so basically I hide the original and keep visible the group that was installed if that's even a word and then I save that one out right because it's got the UVs and the optimized mesh that I basically just ran so you want to hide the other and then separate it from the group or separate it from the group and then hide the the original right and then save out selected of the mesh that you just ran installed on uh, that it kicks out automatically uh, so I'll, I'll show you how it works when it when it comes up and it's done but what I'm gonna do here is just set up a 4096 project I've uh, grabbed the mesh so this is the UV low and it's not like I'm working in subdivisions anything or anything it's actually non subdivided geometry um, but I saved it as uh, just a, as low right and as an OBJ brought it in uh, create texture set per UDIM tile, yes, and normal map format. I'm actually going to switch this to OpenGL. Uh, compute tangent per fragment, yes, uh, and then I can add the maps. And so what I'm going to do is add from that ambient occlusion map all the way down to the thickness and open these guys up. And so now it'll more or less kind of bake these in and bring these textures in, and then I can just place them over, and then we can start texturing, right? So, OK is what I click. And there's the wall, right? And there's my textures that I brought in. And then basically, I just take all of these maps, like normal map. And already you can see how some of the detail popped out, right? So it did a, a fairly good little bake on the asset, right? Considering. Uh, let's try, I believe this is ambient occlusion. His thumbnails are so small. Yep, there you go. So that's the AO. Still looking a little bit better. Uh, and then let's see, ID map. So you just pull all of these from the textures here on the shelf. It automatically will, you know, when you, because of the first panel, I brought in all of the maps, which automatically placed them into the shelf's textures. Um, and so, like, if I save this, all of these maps will still be here tied in. Um, and then after doing some texture work here, you can even uh, do some stuff in Quixel. Like if you're still using Quixel Suite, I, I know they don't support it anymore. They're actually going to sundown it, or I, I guess is it, it's called. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to start doing things through Mixer and all of the maps would be pretty much the same. So if you're going to come in to Substance and do a few other little things, like I, I like to do decals uh, which is something that I'm going to show you guys how to do in here. Um, basically, you can bring in some of the same maps uh, just using like a fill layer. Uh, but for, for now, let's just start uh, setting some of these up 
and I'm going to finish plugging these maps in. I'm going to do, uh, I believe that's the world space. And then that's got to be the position. And then that last gray one was the thickness. There we go. And then curvature, I believe. Curvature and displacement. Displacement, oddly enough, uh, I don't know if this thing right off the bat uses a height. Strangely. I wish it did. Or maybe I have to set it, set it up in some way. But, like, it's turned in here on the channels, and I'm sure it, it produces one. But I'm not going to use the height and in, in substance on this one coming, you know, from InstaLot. So, uh, thickness in our last one, it's curvature, right? I believe that's curvature. Yep. Put that in there. And so, pretty much, we're ready to go, right? Uh, and kind of different to... Sorry. There we go. Kind of different to something like Quixel uh, and working with 3D. Um, you know, just hit the C key to see your color map, right? But I know that it, it pretty much works out uh, because I did it inside of ZBrush and I know generally what areas have breakups, um, even looking at the thumbnail there. But this is how I start to fit things in. So let's say, for example, I'm just going to put like a regular layer in there and then maybe add mask with uh, color selection uh, and then I guess uh, pick a color and we'll do this one and then probably this I can fill with something uh, actually I should have just used like a smart material just really quick because we're in here just very briefly uh, actually, I'm going to hide that guy. And I'll just bring in materials. No, not that. Uh, something good. Steel painted. Smart material, maybe. That should be fun. There we go. And let me bring down the list. Let's go dark steel or something, right? And I'll put this guy be at the top there there we go and so basically with this I can right click it and add the mask and that would be the area of texture right and so I can sort of cordon off different textures and different fields for different surfaces right and so pretty much that is how I got it to look over here. So just adding in different materials for like all of the different masked off parts uh, to give it some breakup. Maybe add, you know, a, two, a, a few different uh, saturate colors, that sort of thing. And um, yeah, I bake it out in final and save it. And there it goes. And so generally like say, if, for example, if I was working in Quixel, the folder that it makes, um, these are all of the PSDs, the working PSDs for the project. Uh, and then I can reopen it by opening its XML file when I have Quixel open. Uh, you just load project and then open, click on this file and it basically opens up every setting like it was when you baked it. Um, or last saved, you know, your individual Quixel file. Um, and then the splats folder is where all of the flattened Targa files for each of those textures are. So. Uh, these are basically what I'm going to start to plug into materials into Marmoset. So by the time, uh, let's say for those that have never seen this in Marmoset, basically if I come over here and make a Unreal 4 template material, and I drop this material on site onto the, the actual mesh, like let's say this, I actually duplicated some of these pieces to make the expanse of the wall, so I'm just going to hide them for a moment and focus in on this one piece. And then that would be the material, right? Applied. And then basically, I have to click on these and start to, you know, plug in each individual material. Uh, so let's see. I can actually just drag and drop these. So I'm going to do that. I can take uh, normal, 
and then once I view it with the normal we can see all of the texture that was already in the normal data right the roughness oops sorry metallic I'll just drop in metallic uh, AO, uh, height 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 whoops need to set this sorry to height and then height goes in uh, and this is kind of funky but it, it will basically throw it off because the scale needs to be reduced uh, I'll just set it kind of low and give it just a small amount of bump uh, roughness and of course maybe albedo need maps Albedo would be the base color, but uh, actually I needed to click that on, and I'll load the albedo. Whoops, sorry, not albedo. Albedo goes here, sorry, AO goes here. There we go. So if I uncheck this, the light's kind of strong on it, but you can at least see from the front part, with all of the maps minus the color, it starts to get uh, have it you know little small detail values that are between the normal and AO for shadowing and stuff like here in the corner um, every once in a while you can probably do AO and cavity and still work with those even though you're working in PBR but usually with PBR you just need the four maps uh, because AO itself is generally you can bake it into the diffuse color or it's already pre-baked in but just for a little bit of extra shadow and stuff I, I like to added on separately and so this material would basically be you know set right with color uh, and then from marmoset I can actually save this right so I can just save um, or export this material uh, so let's say in the same folder and actually I've already got one saved out but yeah and we can save it and replace it and it would be the same thing so if I make a, another scene or something like that, I've already got this material saved and I can just import it into the next project where I'm using the same asset with maybe others and you can sort of uh, make like a material groups, uh, like folders, uh, and then basically, you know, anything associated with just, you know, your environment props uh, and their, their textures, you can sort of uh, cordon them off into another uh, material group, right? Uh, and so sometimes this list starts to get long and to organize that groups really can help out right uh, and so of course you know marmoset is a basically a full-on render um, I mean, it's it works pretty real-time and um, you know you can plug in the maps and do a lot with lighting um, as well as you know fog elements or volumetrics uh, which are fun to play with um, and then when I compose them I'm actually gonna open the larger scene file for this um, I'll show you guys also the terrain that I'm gonna use for this it takes a second sometimes for these things to open up so bear with me Then zero none. How's it going? <laughs> All right. So this is just a sort of like still kind of basic in, in its workings, but here's a larger part of a scene that I was kind of composing an idea to, and um, it would be impossible probably for me to actually throw this entire set straight forward into Unreal. So I'm kind of parting it out, and I'm not even really sure if I'm going to use these buildings or not. But sort of to the preview of. Uh, the image that I showed earlier, uh, probably online, uh, was in the, the today's banner uh, for ZBrush Live, I guess for, for today's stream. But I have a city set here that I've made and it really works well. I zoom in a little bit, so I'm gonna zoom in. And I have some of the previous ships and stuff that I've worked on um, here 
you know, uh, in ZBrush Live and also privately, I've been building uh, assets for some of my small films here. And so this actually, this cruiser, funny enough, was designed by Kirill Chepazenko. Uh, and I borrowed his ship and added on a few other bits and started, you know, putting it into a few motion clips and sort of as a collaboration and, and it, you know, I use it as the larger cruiser and a set of ships that I have prepared. But this is basically sort of the scene that I, I have going in Marmoset, right? And eventually my goal is to move this into Unreal, but I'm basically doing some sort of test views or, or sort of composing here in Marmoset. So coming straight off of the heels of ZBrush uh, and using Blender together, um, and then, you know, of course, the, the chain of texturing that I mentioned before, where I'm using both Substance and Quixel to uh, quickly uh, put some textures on assets and using uh, color IDs. Finally, when they end up in a scene, this is kind of uh, just some rough planning on, on how I'm going to set things up. So the wall, and then the, there's a wall, and then a, 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 basically a terrain map. And this terrain map uh, was generated by a friend of mine, uh, Grumbletonian, in uh, World Creator. And he was really excited to show me this. Uh, and then basically what I did was use that map data from World Creator um, and just took the terrain and Z-remeshed it inside of ZBrush. Uh, and it kept a lot of the major faces, which was great because the, the polys were so dense I wouldn't have been able to, to use the, the information. So I used ZRemesher 3 to ZRemesh it, uh, and then UV Master to just uh, you know unwrap it and unfold it. And then I used Mixer. Um, I have like sort of like a, a general uh, terrain tile for this scenario that I've been using, uh, in which I'm trying to mimic a, uh, an impression of like a Mars or, or Ganymede-like rock, right? I think Mars would probably be a little reddish with a lot more dirt, but uh, this is sort of a mix between like a, a concrete, like a pitted concrete, and uh, some Icelandic rock, which amazingly kind of looks a lot like some of the rock that I've seen in some photos of Ganymede, right? Which is pretty much a, a hard surface planet with ice, I believe, uh, collected along its surface, maybe a few other things, but one of the moons of Jupiter. Look it up, Google it. It's pretty cool. Science is cool. So, anyway. So for this uh, city <laughs> city in, in Ganymede, uh, I'm setting up a, a spare plane behind the terrain, uh, the wall in between that, and then I think I turned it off, but I have uh, some cards, like alpha cards that I've set up uh, in the scene. And let me just uh, find those so I can turn them back on. And the holograms themselves also, I'll take a look at some of the materials and show you how I set these up. Um, these holograms would basically be projected mid-air and these are just basically like a 2D plane uh, with a, gra a PNG graphic, uh, transparent graphic uh, put inside, right? And it's also used uh, the same way, um, you know, like for decals and stuff. Um, whenever you put decals on uh, models through either substance or something like that, you might grab an alpha and also a, like a PNG file of like just like the color graphic but just transparent single object on a layer right uh, and then you can bring that into Photoshop and save it out or you know draft it up with Illustrator if you want and you know make some cool little graphics or something like that it's always neat uh, or like heads up display kits something like that uh, and then basically what I did was just bring them in to uh, that same Unreal template uh, material and then applied it Except in this case, I am only applying it to the albedo map, and I believe also the emissive, uh, and also the transparency, which is set to add. Uh, and then basically what it'll start to do is start to glow, and then to get that extra glow in frame, a lot of times what I do is I'll go over to uh, the camera settings in the outliner, and for that I'll turn up something like the bloom. Uh, and with a little bit of chromatic aberration which you can find on distortion right and then it gets sort of like a nice film grainy kind of look and then maybe finally you know if you do something like an animation because there is like a, a whole keyframe system of animation here that you can set up 
which is really cool. And you can take those PNG sequences and move them over to uh, After Effects or something like that. Uh, what's the Japanese text on the hologram? Uh, if I zoom in here, this line is actually translated from, from Chinese. But this is Ganami de Kyo wa Kokushi. <laughs> is what it would be. Uh, it's basically like a, a democratic city of uh, Ganymede, like a almost like a like a it's an independent little colony on Titan. Is sort of the theme that I'm going for, and it's about you know the the troopers there that uh, are sort of like uh, rescue guys, and so they do these they're like the space rangers of space sort of thing scenario that I'm going for. But anyway, I wanted to find let's see here fog turn that on uh, this is kind of heavy and I put it in frame and a lot of this gets a lot more clear um, if it's the fog is too thick by the time I get to Photoshop because um, in a lot of ways I can set the resolution of this thing and if I wanted to save like a, just a visual keyframe of this uh, I'll do image and open just for example sake And then once it gives me an image, I can open it in Photoshop. Uh, 2020, that's fine. And let me crack it open, and then I'll just adjust it, and see, we'll see how it looks. It's a really cool way, uh, say for example, workflows like this, if you're a cinematic person, and maybe you're doing things, uh, composing just models for like a, almost like a storyboard or like a key visual is to put assets inside of uh, Marmoset and build a scene uh, and put it together just to see what it looks like, um, see what lighting looks like because you can actually set up different lights uh, in different areas and then everything uses uh, HDRI lighting um, which there are a lot, like a really good collection of built-in HDR um, images inside of Marmoset or Skyboxes. Yeah, I think that's what they're called. Uh, T-Sky files. Um, and then there are a lot of um, T-Skies that you can get externally, so you can load in other HDRIs. Or if you have HDRIs of your own, you can just load them up as an image, and it will apply them. Um, but anyway, so I'll take something like this, and... Uh, Go, let's see, where's my layers? I must have closed it. Oh, there it is, hiding. Sorry, there's properties. And there's my channel. I lost my layer palette. There we go. And I'll just set up something like a levels. And I'll move this all the way black scale this in a little bit and so I get like a nice little bit more controlled image I think this one probably I need to reset the focus because it got a little blurry but that's pretty much the idea is basically I would make uh, stylistic frames um, and then worry about animation later or maybe scene building for animation a little bit later but this is kind of how I catch and keep and compose a lot of these images after I texture them right uh, and so you know kind of built uh, up this scene and I'm trying to actually find it inside the file but there should be like a series of uh, a series of alphas that I've had in this file um, planes that basically sort of tell the story of how this this uh, wall is important and I'm trying to find out what I did with them or if they simply got from this file erased <laughs> which is entirely possible sorry about that uh, I can't seem to find it right off the bat there are a lot of objects in here unfortunately uh, some of them which are uh, have groups and then that gets a little bit slower but I need to sort of comprise some of these objects uh, into one uh, asset group uh, in the you know, I guess in the, the mesh groups, because if you have a lot, it, it gets to a little bit bogged down. Like uh, just one of these might have like a, uh, 
a ton of like geo attached to it because I didn't merge it all together, right? Um, in some ways, sometimes I actually want to keep different elements like separate, like uh, these lights here. Let's see if I can focus in on this. The tiny little LED lights are actually just like uh, pieces of geo, and I could probably move them around or compose them, you know, however later, or align them to the to the pole or what have you. But uh, just using like the the sunset from a the HDRI, and if I turn it around, I can probably get like a few different type of lighting scenarios like this, and then I frame it up. And this sort of thing, in this way, like a close-up would work really nicely because things are a little bit darker, shadowed, um, maybe the textures look a little bit more even, and it's pretty, it gets a little bit easier to under stand what the field of view would be or like what what objects stand out in the focus of the frame and so I'll just kind of set some things like this up uh, lighting wise or maybe I'll add lights uh, to it and getting getting you know working to get a more interesting frame you know something like this where maybe it's a little cooler up top frame and a little warmer uh, below uh, and this sunrise maybe works well with some of the yellow highlights of the wall that sort of thing Right. So part of the fun thing behind, you know, just using ZBrush by itself, which is a great sculpting tool, is kind of um, going and finding, uh, you know, sort of like cinema like tools like this to sort of make props and, and compose an image and, and really sort of sell some story into what you're creating, I guess, is why I do stuff like this. So it's a lot of fun. So anyway, let's go back. I wanted to actually have time enough, and since I got about 45 minutes, I think I'll do some sketching inside of ZBrush uh, because there's some props that I wanted to kind of come up with. Um, but really quickly, let's go back to Maya, and I think this is done. Yep, it's done. So just to show you guys uh, how this baked out, um, I'm actually going to, on the keyboard, select the Instalod. As you can see, it marked it. You know, with just a, not not even a, I just changed the the title of the object and it added Instalot it uh, onto it. So you want to select that one, and this is the one that basically has been baked out. So I'll hit Shift P to separate it from the group, and then I'll hit Control G and make it a group on its own. And I can say something like, "This would be the high," and now this would be our new low. Right, and I think you can even set this thing to set um, Instalot profile. So, like, if you're uh, Unreal people and you're looking to do some things, um, setting up a, a an LOD profile, you know, where you have like a few different de steps of detail, uh, and want to do a call out, it'll actually save it in that manner. So it'll, you know, you can set up a profile for three different resolutions, and then you it basically bakes out like the everything, the the UVs. The procedural textures that you'll need to texture it, uh, it'll auto um, UV the, the mesh itself and then it remeshes it and then it kicks it out and then so now I have to save it, right? So now that I've separated it from the group, I'm just going to take this one, the original one, and hide it and I'm going to select the other and probably I think if I hit that, I had hit that 6, uh, which basically let, allows me to see the vertex color, you can see how in this one all of the color map info held uh, inside of the model, right? So remember when I said I couldn't see it before, but now I could see it for some reason. The backside, because I believe it's got a default light or like global light, it would look black, but it's not like it's flipped or anything. It's actually been fixed, and you can see the color there, right? Just like that. I think there's like a probably a global light that's defaulted to the front of this. That's why can't see the back so well but you can see the front so anyway I've hidden this and I can just take this select the entire group you want to make sure to select the, the just the group itself uh, and it's already saved out in our folder our test folder all of the maps for it and then basically I can just take this and while it's selected as a group uh, export selection 
and this is where probably I might flip from FBX export to OBJ export uh, there we go OBJ export uh, and I have groups on here and basically it, even though it's checked on even I don't probably even need it but I'll leave it on um, it doesn't have any parts except for it because it's all been merged or remeshed into one manifold mesh so all of the little separate bits I could only apply texture to them because it has uh, a color ID right uh, and then of course I'll pick where I'm gonna save it uh, we did our well install our test bake and then I'll save it export the selection right and then it saves it so finally what we get uh, let me bring up a folder or an explorer window there we go and this basically is the all that I need to move on so right so uh, ambient occlusion through thickness map uh, and then of course our OBJ and MTL here uh, MTL probably don't need so much but OBJ is pretty important and then this OBJ is what I would use furthermore to do bakes inside of Quixel or Substance, either one. But this is pretty much everything you need to get started to texture everything, right? Uh, and then finally, hmm, let's see. I wanted to go back over to here, I believe. I want to show you guys this really quick uh, before I do anything or go back to ZBrush. So uh, back in Marmoset, when we're, uh, earlier I was talking about shooting some of this stuff from... Um, uh, Marmoset to Unreal. So I wanted to actually try it live and show you guys kind of how it sets up. So I have one single material here and in fact actually let me close the other one because I think I'm running a little bit slow. We already saved this so now basically I'm just gonna quit this. Don't need to save it because I saved it out and the high we have so I'm not gonna worry about it. Get rid of that and let's get rid of this for a moment. Gotta close some things down so we get some better performance. Uh, and then I'm gonna keep this on the side because I'm gonna come back here. But let's kick this out, all right? So I'm actually gonna just take this and save the scene. Uh, boy, for some reason ran a little slow there for a second. I'm going to save it out uh, and then I just have the single material here, right? Uh, so I'm actually going to go to material and just uh, clear unused control backspace, clear unused material. So just the single one uh, and I'm actually going to turn off uh, turn off the fog because it's probably not going to bring it over to Unreal. You actually need to set up different volumetric stuff there. And so we just have our clear view of this asset, right? Had time enough to slap a few textures onto it, and so I want to see how it comes out. So, yeah, the cyberpunk feels. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, Richard. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Thanks for watching. Anyway, so I'm going to take this, and I've saved it, so I'm going to open up uh, Unreal really quick. I don't know why, for some reason, my machine is running really slow. Let's actually quit Substance. Um, take that off. Sometimes when I open different render apps at the same time, I get a little sluggish on the performance for some reason. But uh, I have two, two 2080 Supers that are in linked, and it's, every once in a while, it's still a lot, maybe with the stream going at the same time it's a little wonky sorry about that but um, let's do this there we go at the games launcher launch unreal derpity derp derp derpity derp. I need something to drink.
So hopefully next time uh, we have a stream together, I will have probably textured most of a city with some crazy props. Um, and I want to also mention a couple of things in some of the designs of some of these things I have. Uh, at time, I do a lot of um, custom modeling with a lot of my shapes, like the major forms of things. And then sometimes for detailed trim, because I'm, I'm hooking these assets up so fast, uh, there are times when I use uh, kit bash kits. And I want to put a special shout out on some of these kits. Uh, for some, a few of these assets, the kits that I used, uh, I used uh, Vitaly's Mega Structure kit. Uh, for a few small trim elements to add to both the wall and the pyramid and so I should probably especially point that out and also the wall has a few bits also by um, Jama Jurabayev if I'm I hope I'm not butchering his name uh, too bad but Jama is a great designer if you ever get a chance check out some of his tutorials on on Gumroad uh, because the guy he, he's got mad skills uh, He's a, one of the designers, I believe, over at uh, ILM, and he does uh, some amazing work. Uh, especially, he's also a fellow Blender and also Hard Ops user. So, uh, yeah, check him out. Uh, so anyway, in Unreal, um, I'm going to go ahead and just do like a new project. And I believe I should have uh, the plugin activated on here, but just blank with no starter content. And then I'll create project. Hopefully, it tells me that it's already installed so I don't have to reboot it again. But every once in a while, you have to turn it back on. So just when you get Unreal open, manage plugins, click enabled, and it's the tool bag importer. And uh, what this one is, is basically just like a, a plugin from uh, Marmoset. And basically, it'll import the scene files uh, from Marmoset into Unreal, and it actually brings in all of your materials and plugs them up, which is great. So I'm just going to restart this because I had to click Enabled on it. What? Oh, it is enabled. Okay, so then I can just close this. And down here at the bottom is the content browser, right? And so I'm simply just going to hit import. And then I believe if you look on here, oop, it goes all the way off my screen. But I should have a TB mat or a TB scene uh, available in all files. But if you scroll down, I believe it should be under either tool bag starting with T yep tool bag material and scene so I'm gonna open up a scene there we go uh, where did I put the scene put it in the pyramid there we go and there's my file I'm gonna open it uh, and then when I open it one of the cool things that I'm gonna do is just a uh, Make sure that it gets everything. Sometimes it'll ask you, like if you're missing a, a metalness map or something like that, um, you know, prompt per material. It's already got a path for importing everything. And then I'm just going to hit import as blueprint, by the way. All right, so it imported it. And if you look at it, you can double click it. There's the model. So the scale of that is pretty, pretty big, actually. It's humongous. It's like off the charts big. I'd probably have to zoom way, 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 way out. So let's see if I can take this and scale it. too much it'll flip it upside down you know what actually hold on let's do this let's just put it into the scene and I'll hit F and zoom out so it's like bigger than the world so massively scaled if I want to scale it down and film it sort of a little bit more miniature and just take it and click it way down let's work that way 
and then I want to change my camera speed sometimes because the camera can be pretty slow. Oh jeez, it is huge. There we go. I'll probably scale it down just a wee bit more, but I need to set the scale a little smaller. Probably there. That's a little bit more workable. Um, anyway, once I bring in the other props, I'll, I'll probably get a better sense of scale because I know the world is probably on point. Whereas, uh, like say the the scene with the uh, rock piece or the landscape piece, I'm probably going to scale it appropriately to that and the walls. I actually have a scene uh, going uh, for that in another project. But I just wanted to bring this in and kind of show you guys how it looks uh, by the time I get it over here. So it does work. So you can, all of the materials and everything are already plugged. All the textures are there and imported. And so um, then you can start to set this up to render it here. All right? So just um, kind of a cool different little way to, you know, get some of your assets from ZBrush over to Unreal right and or to uh, marmoset I guess is the takeaway and so right now what I need to do is probably start building some other buildings like this uh, not necessarily a pyramid but you know sort of in the, the cyberpunk feels I'm gonna hit it in the cyberpunk feels and probably get like some other props going uh, like smaller buildings some mega structures that would be in in the uh, set and I probably will use like a mixture of some that I make for more unique shapes and then I'll probably extra in the scene add like a few bashes of some. Um, I actually found some really good ones on art, uh, art station if you guys are interested but yeah I mean these kinds of things are really great to make even inside of um, ZBrusher so I kind of wanted to maybe make some extra ones that I'm going to plop in around the foot of this thing. So. I'm going to put uh, Unreal on ice, Marmoset on ice, and go back home to ZBrush. Click on my tablet here. And let's maybe make a prop. So let's see here. I'm actually going to grab a different tool, maybe a 3D cube. Hit F. And let's see. Get those polygroups, initialize this guy. And and again, I, I apologize. I've been so busy over the last week. Um, I really wanted to start rolling you guys with uh, 2020, version 2020, and I didn't have time to update it in this entire week. I've just been running crazy. But uh, soon, next, probably by next stream, I, I assure you, we will be using 2020 and getting into some of its... Uh, awesome features. Uh, new cloning like brushes are really awesome. But uh, Sorry about that. All right. A pin. Uh, wanted to initialize this guy as like a QQ but I need to probably make it a Polymesh 3D first. So let's do that. Make Polymesh 3D. Now initialize it as a Q cube. And we'll start small. So I'm gonna grab this. And for the whole object, I'm gonna maybe scale it up a bit. There we go. And I wanna chop this guy up. And I'm gonna do uh, use the Z modeler tool to do it. Um, I'm gonna go over to Q, and now that I've got this scaled up, I'm gonna hit B, Z, grab the Z modeler tool, and maybe just do a little pushing and pulling on some geo, and see if we can have fun. All right, the front is the blue line there, which would be the Z forward. As you can see from the bottom, it's a small hairline telling you which is X and which is Z for those just uh, kind of new to ZBrush perhaps. And I'm gonna hit the space bar and basically pick something like uh, insert edge loops. 
And we just chop it up a bit. And I'm going to select this guy. And maybe put in some on the side here. Maybe some right there. And kind of what I'm doing is thinking about what I'm going to kind of bevel in just to do some shape building. Okay, so now that I have these faces, I'm just going to use the Q mesh. Uh, maybe to a quarter step. One side. Yep, that looks good. Just pull this down and it'll snap directionally. So, like uh, with quarter step, like if, if I wanted an angled sweep or something, I can only, it'll start to move by ticks, snapping ticks until it's flat. And let's do maybe one more here and one on the inside. And I'll do these two guys. That's kind of neat. Do right there, right there. And I'll pull the mesh out to about here. And maybe another little platform there. And maybe some stuff off to the sides. There we go. Oops, I want to move it when I add another. So I'm just adding some loops because I want to try something uh, creating like a small catwalk on the side of a platform or something like that. And so I'm just thinking of loops that I'm going to pull out so that I can take the smaller piece of geo, like uh, I bring the brush size down and I just alt and click on the individual face here. What I can do is pull this out, extrude it as a Q-mesh. And um, then what I want to do is just add uh, loops, like uh, equal loop sizes here. Try to get it close on the other side. Oops. Here. And then what I could do is probably hit Alt and click on that face and this face. And then when I pull them out as a Q mesh, it should snap and bridge them together and it'll weld it. And that would be like a little tiny catwalk uh, structure that I could use. I could even go in there and mess with the geo even more and cut it. But I do a lot of blockouts this way using Zmodeler these days for um, you know stuff like little building props. Um, and then it's kind of easy to build it inside of ZBrush because of course now that I have polygroups on everything, remember what I was saying about not having complex uh, edge bevels on all of the edges. So I've kept this flat, so if I ever needed to do anything like a polygroup by n normal, it, it should be pretty easy to, to solve. Um, and even if I take this as a base mesh and I bring it into Blender and I start chopping it up in something like um, the Hard Ops tool um, or box cutter tools that I've been telling you guys are all the rage, um, it's pretty easy to do some cuts inside of there you know, with some of the nice surfacing from just like simple geometry that I have here. Right. So I'm going to come in and just uh, do some nice little designing of trim detail. And go in here and grab all these faces. Oh, sorry, i got to make sure that I'm keeping an eye on Why do I prefer Unreal to Unity? I haven't used... Um, Unity yet or tried to jump into it. I, I, I hear there's some great things about it and it, I've seen some of its uh, filmmaking capabilities which are really cool um, but I really want to try to use Unreal. I was really impressed with uh, uh, the look of the render you know and it seemed pretty pretty easy to use but 
uh, as it gets more com more complex for the features, it seemed more accessible to me than Unity. But I could be wrong, <laughs> and I'm sure I, I have probably been proven wrong. Um, but it ju it just seemed the most accessible to me, and, and and had some of the features that I really wanted to use. Um, but yeah, you could be using either or purely. Uh, and the same thing goes for cutting out textures. Like by the time you get uh, set to texture objects um, inside of uh, either or, you can calibrate for either of those pretty easily. Alright, so that's a solid loop. So I'm going to take this and maybe do a bevel here. Bevel, bevel, bevel. Uh, and I'll do the complete and just a single row. Yeah, see that scaling? I don't like that. I always have to fix stuff like that for some reason. I don't know why, but it sort of offsets a little bit. And usually I have to straighten those out later, so I will. But now I'm not going to worry about it. Let's uh, do a little bit. Oops. Oops. Sorry. shapes a little bit by just extruding some faces while I have it pretty simple uh, there we go and then I'll take this guy this guy this guy and this guy uh, maybe add down here and I'll add some repetition and pattern Maybe just uh, pull this out a little bit, right? And so I'm not exactly subdividing this because um, if I was to hit dynamic subdivision, just for example, I don't have a lot of uh, support loops set up, so it's gonna go entirely soft on me. Yeah, and you don't want that. So if you were gonna handle some of this, the more loops that you put in as reinforcements uh, and or adding things like creasing uh, to keep the shape, are probably recommended, right? So, like for example, say, say if I shift D and go back to you know just like a hardened view or the first subdivision, I would have to come in here and put like a loop here and here along its edges, and the same thing goes here and here and here. Here. Basically, that way I would keep uh, sharper shapes. If I was going to keep that sort of square shape in the wall, but maybe smooth it out a little bit. Maybe some equally distributed loops uh, and or creasing, creasing the edges uh, would work a little bit better. So that you know, by the time you get to here, at least you're maintaining some of the shapes. Maybe one on the inside so you can get rid of the pinching. Um, Actually, this guy is close enough. I could probably take this one and just slide it and do the edge loop complete. And then by the time you hit Control D or D, uh, actually Control D would subdivide it. You just want to hit D key for uh, dynamic subdivision to get a preview of it. So it looks starts to get a little bit sharper when you have some control loops in, right? Uh, and you you can actually kind of just bake in detail like that later, you know. Uh, but just I'm just trying to create some shapes and do a block out and sort of compose like a piece of a mega structure like a building like arch biz kind of stuff uh, but you know I have to sketch it out first but just to show you how zebra uh, zbrush could be a really cool sketch tool for some of the, these kinds of things you know like uh, just creating like a building or something like that uh, or like a prop asset so I hit shift D again and then, you know, I add details to things like this. Uh, so, like, sometimes I'll even, you know, put uh, curves on it for, like, little cables and that sort of thing. And I'll use, like, just the, the curve tool and just uh, sculpt up, like, some little dangling cables or something, which is always cool. Um, 
and then I separate them just so that I, I have the sketch in mind. So, like, a, what is it? Is it curve two? I think it's curve two. Let's do curve two. And I'll turn symmetry off. And let's see. If I go over to stroke, I'm sure. And do like a uh, lock to start, lock to end. And then I'm not going to snap to mesh. I'm going to actually let it bend. I could do something like this. And then get the draw size really tiny. And click on the line, which would reduce it. And then I could take uh, this and move it. Doesn't want to move. It's not going to go that far. I would be surprised. Anyway, we'll just stretch it out that way. There we go. Get this attached right up there. And then maybe tweak the position of it. And you can use it as a, a cable or something, like a cable detail. And I'll separate it from the mesh so I can repeat it and maybe use it in a couple of other spots. But uh, these are the kinds of things that I'll I'll do to try to like you know just imagine it and and execute it in a mesh really quickly so that I can get busier in the things that I'm interested in, like actually composing the the rest of the image, I guess. And worry about like a lot of the hard sculpting later after having uh, sort of like a, a worked out view. All right, and then because of the rest of this being masked, um, I can position this later a little bit separately. But just if I'm, if I'm okay with the way that it hangs, of course, I can split mask points and just have this as a smaller sub tool and then I can move around. guy down uh, and then of course you know you have tools like move elastic and stuff you could probably just use this turn this like this move it in I'm just thinking I'm thinking about how this is gonna look when I turn and look up at it you know like if I was standing lower on the ground or maybe this was a building top um, and then as I build de you know details along the sides of these things I would, you know, probably add more geo extra to it, and before you know, uh, in a few minutes, you have yourself like some kind of crazy cyberpunk mega structure, man. It's deep. Anyway, oops. I'm gonna take uh, and get the move brush a little bit. Got 15 minutes more. It's gonna make this good. a little bit uh, and take this and duplicate it a couple of times Titan self-defense force yes like uh, Richard to answer your question yeah, it's like the Titan self-defense force, or the, the guys in the ship. <laughs> I have like this uh, little cool s story scenario where uh, in the ship that I showed you guys at the top of the stream, uh, not the larger one here, but there's a, another one uh, that I call the space bus. Uh, it's, it's sort of like an old school... Um, you know, space 1999, very 2001 looking sort of retro ship in the mix of all of these other ships. And there's a, a plank and it's ready for guys to just jump right out of the side of it, you know. So I did a couple of animations um, to that. Um, if you guys keep a, a hold of my YouTube channel, 
which uh, here I'll show you guys. You can just look me up as Tony Leonard or Tony Koro. That's T O N I K O R O on um, on YouTube, and I have a channel in which some of these experiments I actually put up. Uh, or I'm starting to actually upload even more. Uh, here I'll just bring it up as a as an example. So this is my YouTube channel, and a lot of these that, you know, after I design them, once I get some motion clips or something, I have a tendency to try to post them up. Uh, and so, like, you know, I think I've shown this one to you guys before, but every once in a while, I'll put them up and just add sounds and give it the sort full cinematic, you know, sort of feel. So if you remember, like, the when I did the spider tank that I was working on, uh, that one I actually took and rigged out in Blender and had an animation, like an FBX animation. And soon enough, um, I'm going to take some time next time, or, um, maybe next stream, and sort of go through some character workflow where I take... Um, I've been experimenting with a, a lot of character designs where I take them and make them move using auto-rigging through Mixamo. Uh, and I think I've messed around with Fuse a few times maybe taking those as a base and customizing them in ZBrush uh, and that's something of course that I want to explore a little bit more uh, it's actually more deserving of me recording a time-lapse and putting it up on ZBrush Central for for you know some point in the future but uh, pretty much a lot of the assets that I've been making I've been trying to um, make my portfolio include more motion uh, and so like I'm, like I'm really interested in rendering things and getting them at least walking, moving, you know, showing how mecha mechanical designs would interact with each other, uh, maybe sometimes even staging and lighting, uh, and trying to really, I don't know, excel at uh, having a, more of a cinematic eye and, and trying my hand at it. So uh, look forward to that, because I'm probably going to talk about, probably post more on it as I go. <laughs> And, uh, and it should be fun. So anyway, let's get to this. Back to ZBrush. Z modeler again. I think I need to uh, just add some parts here. And I'm gonna take and uh, Get these two guys make like a little port in here. Like a little sort of recessed area. And this will be inset to make make just like a little window area. And so I can take these guys here and do uh, I believe it's insert. That'll cause a nice little bevel for me, and then I'll take uh, this one and Q mesh it in. Actually, whoops, forgot to hit Q mesh. And for this, a little smaller, I'll actually do a tenth of a step because I just want to go in barely. It cause a small impression. And so when I really zoom into places like this, I don't want to mess around with um, putting too many loops to hold shapes. So this might be a good area to where. You know, you make your brush size really small and get in here and maybe just um, put in some uh, creasing, right? And the creasing will hold pretty much uh, in between ZBrush and most other apps. Uh, I believe in Blender, it's uh, Mark Sharps, uh, and in Maya, of course, it's crease the same. Uh, but they should hold some of the the inside edges of this. So I'm just going to crease it, uh, not complete because it's going to probably go all the way down the line, but I want to just do here. I have symmetry on, so it's doing the, the other side, but I just want to kind of get in there, crease it really quick. Oops. Might be a good idea if you're working in a tight area, uh, maybe like say on the faces or something like that, set it to do nothing. Same with the edge or if you're only working with the edge yeah you can set set your feature but like maybe on the actual vert might want to set it to do nothing so that if you misclick off the area you don't mess it up and extrude something and have some extra faces somewhere 
So I'm just going to crease that. Put a crease there. And this part might be kind of hard to grab. So to really get the camera in there, I'm just going to hit Control Shift and then Alt and hide that for a minute just so I can look up inside of here. It's just hidden, that's all. And then we'll hit here, oops, there, tap there once, tap here once, here and here and here. I'm just going inside of that little window space there and just keeping these sharp so that if I subdivide it or something like that, I don't have to waste more geometry trying to put in uh, reinforcement loops to keep the shape or anything like that. Okay, so if I test look at it again, now you can see it kind of held some of the edge sharp, but probably I need to reinforce a loop somewhere, even though it's creased. Or a couple, come along a couple of other more edges, you know, like uh, here, 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 uh, here. Probably for something like this, you want to do a complete or a partial. All right. So if I go all the way around the edge, but sometimes can uncontrollable about where it goes, depending on how you have uh, your geo set up. So let's just do. Uh, edge there not complete but partial and we'll go halfway around it there we go that's a little bit more controlled and if you actually go over and you need to take it out you know like this one I don't need it creased just intermittently like this I can hit alt and just click on it and it'll take it out right and you can just go around completing the edges and then that way when you hit uh, when you hit dynamic subdivision again you can see where your creases or whatnot are holding up right so maybe there and there one edge for some reason is not There we go. So just one particular edge. I don't know why, for some reason, I can't keep grab that one. There it is. And the same for here. All right. So now I'm about uh, five minutes down to the time. So I want to take a moment to ask you guys if you have any questions. Zen Zero Non, you're working with a 2048 texture size. You know, if, if you it, it 2048 is pretty good. I would even take it a little higher, like uh, try like four and eight. Like I think that uh, as we get better monitor sizes and stuff like that. Or you know what? Here's one thing. Uh, also, um, if you ever um, create something in 3D and following some of these flows if you do like a turntable or anything and you maybe try like two different resolutions like 2k and 4k and then when you do the turnaround and you save the video out of it like uh, say Camtasia or anything like that look at it on a television like a 4k television or something or like the best monitor you can but on a television it looks crazy like it I almost like have to put things in a like a Dropbox or something and then open it up or put it on some media and open it up on my television and look at it just so I can really really see what it looks like because I mean you know it's, it's kind of funny like um, because I've drawn comics like as a comics creator uh, and as a comics artist I draw things on paper a lot and there's this feeling that sometimes when you draw on paper when it gets printed in a print form it takes on a 
totally different life. Well, the same thing can be said about modeling, like in a lot of ways. Like you model something and you see it on screen and you look at it over and over again. And then by the time you get into like engine or you look at it and say Unreal or something like that, it is taken on a, a totally different uh, uh, look or feel, you know, or impression to you, you know, what you thought it would look like in your mind might, it might be different than that. So it's always kind of cool to explore different options so that you could control the look of, of what you're doing. In fact, here's something where I forgot to have symmetry on and I totally did it on one side and didn't do it on the other. But that's okay. We can work on that. So this one, before it gets too complex, I'm going to actually uh, stop here, and I'm actually going to save this tool, and I'm going to work it. And by the time I finish it to um, an actual asset, of course, I always love to save these things and work on them later um, after our streams together so that next time around I can open it up and show you how far it went. So that's what I'll save this one for. And actually, this is, a, this is kind of a cool shape. It's just like a basic cube, I know, but the idea of having a separating platform from here and then I think uh, I might actually take some of this building away and reduce it and cut into it um, you know doing some other hard surface tricks and we'll come back and we'll take a look at it and I'll, and I'll add to it and we'll let it grow and live its own life but anyway thank you for joining me uh, on this Saturday afternoon I hope you guys have a lovely weekend and af uh, evening because it looks like it's gotten dark since I've been here <laughs> But again, thanks for the fun, and uh, I hope to see you guys next time around. Thank you. Cheers, and have a good one.